So uh, the subject is love of the beautiful. It is a, it's a profound and, and difficult subject uh, to talk about. And many of you are familiar with uh, Dostoevsky's famous saying, beauty will save the world. I want to start off by reading um, the poetry of the Akathist hymn, Glory to God for All Things. It says, in the wondrous blending of sounds, it is your call we hear. In the harmony of many voices, in the sublime beauty of music, in the glory of the works of great composers, you lead us to the threshold of paradise to come and to the choirs of angels. All true beauty has the power to draw the soul toward you and to make it sing in ecstasy. Alleluia. The breath of your Holy Spirit inspires artists, poets, and scientists. The power of your supreme knowledge makes them prophets and interpreters of your laws. Their works speak unwittingly of you. How great are you in your creation? How great are you in man? So this leads us to ask, what is beauty? If all true beauty has the power to lead us into the presence of God, then what, is, what does this mean? As Christians, we believe that beauty is to be found in the Holy Trinity. It is not an abstract reality, it is a person. God is beautiful. And why do we believe this? How do we know that God is beautiful? Well, in the Orthodox Church, we say He is the lover of mankind. We know that God is beautiful because God is love. As St. John says in his epistle, this is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. In the Divine Liturgy, we say, One is holy. One is Lord Jesus Christ, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. But we can also say, One is beautiful. One is Lord Jesus Christ. So beauty is only that which reflects the beautiful one. The Church brings the spiritual crisis of humanity into the framework of what is beautiful and what ultimately lacks true beauty. The whole vision of salvation is a return to beauty. What is Eden in the imagination of mankind if not a remembrance of beauty? The fall of man in the Orthodox tradition is less about a legal fall where a law-abiding citizen commits a crime and God the judge deals out punishment. It's more about the loss of beauty. The image of God in man was distorted. It was not obliterated but it became obscured through sin. One of my favorite hymns is uh, a nativity song, and uh, it's appropriate on the first day of the fast uh, to be reminded of this. Um, we sing it uh, on many nights uh, as, as I'm tucking my, my daughter who's here with me. I tuck her into bed and oftentimes sing this song. And it ends by saying, Christ is born to raise the image that fell of old. Christ came to restore the beautiful image of God within mankind. So salvation is a restoration of this beauty. In the Gospel of Matthew, Christ describes the kingdom of heaven in a very fascinating way. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like a traitor searching for beautiful jewels, who on finding one pearl of great value went out and sold everything and bought it. To many people, humanity is the traitor in this parable, searching for beautiful jewels. Each one of us, we are searching for the kingdom of God. And when we find Jesus Christ, the pearl of great price, we sell everything we have to be in communion with Him. This is a powerful way of reading this. But I also think that this parable can be seen from a different angle. Jesus Christ is also searching. He's searching to find a treasure hidden in a field. He came down from heaven searching for us. He died for you as if you were the only person who ever lived. He was willing to sell everything, to give everything for you. He saw something of such value in you 
that he paid the ultimate price for your love. It's a beautiful thought to think that both God and man are searching for each other. It's a cosmic romance taking place. Christ is searching to find beautiful jewels on the earth. He's looking for his saints. And we are searching for Christ, the beautiful one, a savior to restore the image that fell of old. And all throughout the scriptures, we have these incredible images. The Song of Songs says, Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves. In the Psalms, we read, For your royal husband delights in your beauty. Honor him, for he is your Lord. The new Jerusalem is described as a radiant bride. In Revelation, it says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God like a bride made beautiful for her husband. And these kind of illustrations are throughout the scriptures. These are incredible pictures and poems of, of beauty. And yet it's so easy for us to approach the Christian life from a dry, moralistic place that just simply looks at what I'm supposed to do and what I'm not supposed to do. But this is so far from the orthodox vision of life in Christ. The Christian does not reject fornication because it's wrong in some abstract sense. He turns away from it because it's not truly beautiful. He doesn't pray to be healed from anger and jealousy because he's afraid of being punished. He prays to be healed because he has glimpsed Christ, the beautiful one, and he loves him more than anything else in the world. It's not fear in the human sense that drives him. It is love. It has to be love. Otherwise, it's a religion that has a form of godliness, but has no power. In my experience, traditional Christianity is so beautiful. It is true religion, which possesses communion with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit communicates beauty to creation. He breathes it into the fabric of the world. I'd like to read something from Galatians 5, and <clears throat> it's just an exercise to help us relate to these words. Sometimes we hear things so often that it stops having the same kind of meaning for us. And in this exercise, we're going to put the word beauty in place of the spirit and ugliness in place of the flesh. St. Paul says, but I say, walk by beauty and do not gratify the desires of the ugly. For the desires of the ugly are against the beautiful, and the desires of the beautiful are against the ugly. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you would. But if you are led by the beautiful, you are not under the law. Now the works of the ugly are plain, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, selfishness, dissension, party spirit, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and the like. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. As I walked in here, I noticed the fruits of the Spirit on the wall, and I was reminded that each one of those is a description of what it is to embrace the beautiful. So in the Gospels, we see Christ again and again redefining for humanity what beauty is. For instance, the Beatitudes completely turn the whole fabric of the world inside out. So I'm just going to read them real quick, and I want you to contemplate with me as if Christ were saying to us, this is how you become truly beautiful. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The beauty of these words change the world. So I want to briefly talk about three beautiful things that come to mind 
in reading the Beatitudes, and there's a story in the Gospel of Luke that illustrates these things. It's the beauty of repentance, forgiveness, and the oil of joy. There are many ways that we experience the love of God, but one of the most profound ways Christ revealed to us through a notoriously sinful woman. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and wiped them with her hair, and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, who had invited him, saw this, said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering him said, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, the one, I suppose, whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. That's one of the most powerful observations that I've ever heard, and it stuck with me for for years and years. When Christ said, look at how she loves, she must have been forgiven much. This woman is overflowing with love because she has experienced the beauty of forgiveness. So how do we experience this forgiveness that enables us to abide in God's love? It's through a word which our culture looks upon with disdain. Repentance. It's an ugly word in our culture. Conjures up many undesirable thoughts and emotions. I recently was having a conversation with someone who was inquiring about, you know, Christianity. And um, in the middle of the conversation, I quoted St. Isaac the Syrian. He said, this life has has been given to us for repentance. Do not waste it in vain pursuits. And her response was, yeah, but that sounds so boring. (laughs) It was a great moment, you know, where the, the language of Christianity just completely clashed with the language of our culture. And I... I had to elaborate and express what repentance really was, that repentance is returning to what is beautiful. Repentance is um, turning away from what is fake and destructive and embracing what is healing and beautiful. A repentant soul is a beautiful soul, one that God will not deny, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. He actually saves our tears in a bottle, as it says in the Psalms. That's how precious our tears are to him. So repentance is not this self-hatred, narcissistic focus on how awful we are. Repentance is a lifelong love of the beautiful. So when we repent, we receive forgiveness, and this enables us to love the world and to love ourselves. The world is attracted to those who have experienced forgiveness and who give forgiveness to others. As we know, it's a state of being and not just an action. I pulled across a a scripture that jumped out at me, and Christ said, "Whenever, whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. And St. Paul says, pray without ceasing. 
you put those two things together and you pretty much have to be in an actual state of forgiveness. It's this constant reality. The scriptures tell us that the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world, which is a powerful thing. So that means when God said, let there be light, he was also saying, let the Lamb of God be slain for the salvation of the world. So that means that the entire creation within its very fabric is mercy, is forgiveness. The beautiful of the earth, the beautiful ones, have an attitude of forgiveness, an instinct towards forgiveness, a habit of forgiveness, an attraction towards forgiveness. We see this in the lives of the saints, praying for those who were in the process of killing them, tears streaming down their face, not because they were losing their lives, but because they were praying for those who were persecuting them. It's just a part of their spiritual ecosystem, so to speak. And they don't judge others. Again, not because it's just wrong in the abstract, but judging others is just kind of, it's an ugly thing. So if we want to become beautiful, we must think better of people. I know that's the case for me. Our witness to the world is to the, the condition of our heart and the thoughts we put out into the atmosphere. If the world smells self-righteousness, they turn away from the stench. And why shouldn't they? It's an ugly thing to behold. It's our job to permeate the world with the fragrance of humility and mercy. We are the fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, as St. Paul says. He said, for the rest, my brothers, whatever things are true, whatever things have honor, whatever things are upright, whatever things are holy, whatever things are beautiful, whatever things are of value, if there is any virtue, if there is any praise, give thought to these things. This is our witness to the world. Such is the power of virtue. Even those who don't desire it for themselves admire it when they see it in others. The third incredible thing in this story that we witness in the gospel is that this, this woman who is so filled with love actually anoints the anointed one. How is that even possible? She brings to Christ her deepest repentance, which is an act of love. She brings her tears. She falls at his feet. She brings to him what is precious to her. It's a mixture of her tears and the beautiful fragrance of her new life. The Psalms say that the Messiah is anointed with the oil of joy. He is a man of sorrows who is anointed with the oil of joy. So to be a Christian, to be named after Christ, is to, to share in his anointing, to share in the oil of joy. Father Alexander Schmemann said that Christians lost the world when they lost their joy. Is there anything more contagious than real joy? Why do you su suppose kids flock to Christ? Was it because he was so cold and austere? Or was it because he was radiating with, with life and goodness and joy? Children love to be joyful, and Christ said the kingdom belongs to them. The beauty of a joyful person transcends age. A recent study showed that one of the poorest countries in the world is the most content. They did a survey um, about contentment, and it was one of the most, the poorest countries in the world, way more content than those of us that have so much. And it's not a coincidence because they've been anointed with the oil of joy. Christ suffered more than anyone in history by taking on the sins of the world, and yet 
he was anointed with the oil of joy. And he said, I've spoken these things that my joy would be in you and that your joy would be complete and overflowing. Life is difficult for everyone. The joy of Christ is so needed in our world. People are yearning to be anointed with the oil of joy. They're hungry for it. And I, I think that the enemy hates our joy. He doesn't like our feast days. He doesn't like it when we rejoice in the Lord. So to sum up this story, what we glimpsed is the beauty of this woman's repentance, the splendor of her love, because she had been forgiven so much, and the poetry of a weeping woman overflowing with the oil of joy as she anoints the Christ. So those are three things to contemplate about what true beauty is. Repentance is a beautiful thing. Forgiveness and not judging others is a beautiful thing. And the oil of joy is meant to bring life to the world. There is a potential darkness in the realm of beauty, or I should say, um, there's a potential darkness in how we relate to the beautiful. There's nothing impure within beauty itself, but we are inflicted with, with a sickness that we all battle, and it changes what we are attracted to. We're meant to be attracted to the beauty of God, the beauty of the eternal. But the fall of man changed how we relate to what is beautiful. Eve saw the fruit on the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and it was pleasing to the eye. It was beautiful. She was attracted to it. Even though God had warned them that it would bring death. Lucifer was the morning star, the light bearer. He was beautiful more radiant than all of the angels. And he was the one who fell from heaven. This is a lesson for us as well, because although we have the beautiful image of God within us, just like him, we've corrupted that image. We've corrupted our relationship with the beautiful. In the scripture, speaking of this, this fall, the fall of Lucifer, it says, Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. The image of God within us has been damaged. The beautiful image has been distorted, and now we are oppressed. We struggle. We fight. We run towards the things that injure us. But most of the time, we don't run directly towards these things. The demons rarely say, I want to give you death. I want to destroy you. Rather, they say, I want to give you something beautiful. I want to liberate you. I want to give you something that will make you feel alive, free, powerful, confident. The demons attract us with beauty because they know we were made for it in order to destroy us. See, the world has its list of beatitudes as well. And it's very different from what Christ says is beautiful. So as we read a few minutes before, we heard a beautiful vision from Christ, the Son of God, expressing to humanity what it means to be truly beautiful. But every day we live in a world that says something else. We live in a world that says Blessed are those who are rich in self-confidence, for they can accomplish anything in this world. Blessed are those who are free from all sorrow and pain, for they will enjoy their lives with ease and comfort. Blessed are the proud and stubborn, for they will make their own way in life and succeed greatly. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after wealth and fame, for all will envy them. Blessed are the cutthroats, for no one will be able to stand in their way. Blessed are the deviant and the cunning, for they will climb the ladder of success and rule over many. 
Our culture says, blessed are the individualists, for they shall be called the sons of prosperity. Blessed are those whom none dare persecute, for they shall be the rulers of the earth. Christ says, take up your cross and follow me. Very, very different vision. He calls us to willingly accept cruc crucifixion, to turn away from the temporal pleasures that impede our divine ascent, to turn away from the things that only appear to be beautiful but in truth are hollow and don't possess the nature of God. And so a war is waged between the beauty of heaven and the illusions of sin and death. Again, St. Paul tells us, do not follow the customs of the present age, but be transformed by the entire renewal of your minds so that you may experience what God's will is, that will which is good and perfect and beautiful. The will of God is good and beautiful and perfect. And amazingly, I am still very slow to embrace the beauty of heaven, the beauty of God's will. The mother of God is our great example. She said, let it be done to me according to thy will. God was searching for a beautiful jewel to inhabit, to make his dwelling and save the world. And Mary was this jewel. She was beautiful enough to become the Ark of the New Covenant. But usually, at least I know this is the case for me, usually we come to God not necessarily because our hearts are pure or that we're drawn to his beauty, but because we've already been defeated Life beats us down to the point where we fall to our knees and we finally cry out. Who knows when, that, when those moments are, what it takes, but mysteriously those moments do happen where we fall on our knees and we cry out for true beauty. And this is what we see when we enter the church. I remember the first time I ever walked into an Orthodox church, uh, nobody was there, and this very nice lady um, welcomed me in and told me to just go on inside. And the first experience that I had was just being alone and being surrounded by the icons and the beauty of the church. It was really as simple and as profound as that. And I knew in that moment that this is the real thing. Another moment was one of the first times I was at the Divine Liturgy. And during the Cherubic Hymn, the whole environment seemed to change. And everyone was doing the sign of the cross and saying, Lord, have mercy. And in that moment, I felt like I entered into what was truly beautiful. Everything else, I just remember whispering in my heart, I don't really care about anything else. I don't, I don't care about my career. I don't care about any of this stuff. I just want to be here. I just want to be here, praying <clears throat> with these people. Because I'd never seen that kind of humility. I'd never seen that kind of corporate humility before. It wasn't a, a self-hatred. It wasn't this legalistic form of humility or repentance. It was just beautiful. It was an incredible, incredible beauty. And that's what we experience when we come into the church. We see the image of God, the lover of mankind. We see the beauty and purity of the Virgin Mother. We see the faith of the saints, the wonder of the angels. We see Christ as a child. We stand in awe of his humility. We see the Pantocrator. First time I did, I, I swore. Holy. <laughs> it's true. I was alone. <laughs> Uh, I said sorry right after, but um, <laughs> I was in awe. <laughs> um, 
we're f filled with the fear of God and also the beauty of His mercy. Beauty is all around us. We're surrounded by so many windows into heaven. We're brought to tears by being in the presence of the Holy One, drawn into communion with the Holy Trinity. This should and does set us on fire with repentance and cleanse us from ever judging others. It should lift our hearts into the presence of the mysterious God who loves us more than we could ever imagine. This is the beauty that will save the world. It's not the beauty of the billboard. It's not the beauty of the glitz and the glamour and what the world considers beautiful. There is true beauty. That is what Dostoevsky was speaking of when his character in The Idiot talked about beauty saving the world. It's so important to embrace this because if we turn away from the pleasures of the world and don't embrace the, the true beauty of God, the beauty of life in Christ, then our witness is really nothing to the world. It does no good to be a religion of rejection, saying no to everything. Christianity is a religion of saying yes to what is truly beautiful. So let us, by the grace of God, become beautiful. Let us become resplendent with mercy, adorned with compassion and peace. Let us rejoice in the goodness of our Father and reflect His perfect love. And may we become holy as our Father in heaven is holy. clothing ourselves in humility and meekness, in genuine love and prayer for one another. My hope and my prayer is that the world would be attracted to the beauty of those who follow Christ. May the grace of the Holy Spirit continue to sanctify those who love the beauty of thy house. And I pray that we would echo what St. Porfirio said, love Christ, Put nothing before his love. He is joy. He is life. He is light. Christ is everything. He is the ultimate desire. He is everything. Everything beautiful is in Christ. Thank you.